1 through 13, and what we're looking at today is the secret to national greatness. The secret to national greatness. Uh, my boys have, I, I love these old Patch the Pirates. How many of you ever listened to Patch the Pirates? I think I've asked this before. Patch the Pirate. There are some fun ones. There's one called the Great American Time Machine. You ever listen to that one? There's these two mice, and they come back in history, and they try to find the secret of America's greatness so that they can attack America. And they find it, it teaches a lot of good lessons and a fun thing. Uh, but I think in these days, especially around the election, there are a lot of people that throw this term around about making America great and uh, America's greatness. And, and I'll tell you, there, there are a lot of people that want to make America great, and that's, that's a good thing. It absolutely, truly is. And the Bible has something to say about this. I hope that we don't just discount the Bible when it comes to certain areas of our lives. Oh, when it comes to science, the Bible, the Bible doesn't, hey, the Bible says plenty about science. Absolutely, it does. When it comes to politics, you know, we understand the Bible talks about religion. It has all sorts of things about spiritual. Hey, the Bible has plenty to say about the election of our leaders and who we choose and what laws we set in a nation. And let's look in verses 7 and 8 here. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verses 7 and 8. It says, For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? Verse 8 again, he says, And what nation is there so great, that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? Here we have Moses speaking to the people of Israel, and he's reminding them of the unique privilege that they have as, as a nation that is chosen by God. And he tells them it is a privilege to have the statutes of God. It is a privilege to have the judgments of God. It is a privilege to have God close at hand. It is a privilege to be called to righteous living. Psalm chapter 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And I love that there. Blessed is this man. At the end there it says, whatsoever he doeth, shall prosper. Hey, I don't believe in a prosperity gospel, but I believe that God does bless the righteous. Amen. And we better be careful that we do not take for granted the blessings of God. And that's what Moses is telling them here. He says, hey, you live in a great nation. And he lays out some of these things that, that are blessings from God. And our, our scripture reminds us that we, as believers, as lovers of righteousness, as pursuers of, of godliness, we are blessed. We see that there is prosperity in work and life. Psalm 1, we see here, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. We see that there's protection and deliverance for the godly. Psalm 34 in verse 17, it says, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. There's prosperity, there's protection, there's answered prayer. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. And that's a blessing. I like to be able to have my prayers heard. He talks about peace and security. Isaiah 32 and verse 17, it says, And the work of unrighteousness or of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Man, what a blessing. Life and honor, he says, Proverbs 21, it says, He that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth life righteousness and honor. He says, hey, you pursue that righteousness, you're going to find a few things along the way, that life and, and the honor, provision and fulfillment of needs. Matthew 6, says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. I think you're seeing this. It is a blessed life living for the Lord. Go on, it says, there's joy and gladness. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Psalm 92 talks about the lasting influence of the godly. He says, The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. They shall bring forth fruit 
and old age. Psalm 37 in verse 23 says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He gives direction. He gives guidance. He sees he blesses not just one generation, but he continues. In Psalm 112, he says, the generation of the upright shall be blessed. Hey, it continues to those next generations. There's strength and resilience that he gives us. We see the just man fall seven times and riseth up again. We see there are so many blessings, physical and material and spiritual, and in so many ways because the righteous are a blessed people. Don't take it for granted. Don't, don't, don't miss out on the blessings. And that's what, what this man, what um, Moses is saying here to the people of God. He says, do you get the idea? It is a blessed life living for the Lord, being his people, living according his, to his commandments and his judgments. Don't take it for granted. There's a story I, I saw, and I thought this applied here so well, of an employee at a tool and dye company in Indiana who purchased some used furniture and an old painting for $30. He wasn't very interested in the painting itself. He just needed something to cover a hole in his wall. It's easier than fixing it, Brother Terry. There you go. So he covered this, this hole in the wall, and it hung there for years, just serving a practical purpose. Didn't get noticed or paid attention to, but one day he was playing a board game called Masterpiece, which involves players bidding on famous artworks, and he noticed that one of the cards featured a painting that looked strikingly similar to the one hanging on his wall. Intrigued, he decided to research the style of the painting and discovered that it looked like the work of Martin Johnson Heed, a uh, renowned American still life artist. And if you know still life, it's just flowers on a table, fruit, you know, like those sorts of things. I mean, the same thing you see over and over again everywhere it is. And, you know, and he said it looked a lot like this artist who was known for his flowers and landscapes. And he reached out to this gallery in Manhattan which specialized in these works. And after examining his painting, they confirmed that it was an original piece. And this artwork titled Magnolias on Gold Velvet Cloth, it turned out to be a previously unknown masterpiece that very soon was purchased for a million point two dollars. This, this painting that sat for years just covering a hole in his house, I think it's safe to say that he didn't see the full value of what he had. He took it for granted. You know, it's, just, it's just a painting, it's just something that covers the whole. And I think that there are many of us that take for granted the blessings of living for the Lord. You know, we see these things that are listed here, and as we take time, and I hope we do around Thanksgiving and this time of year, we can think back to the blessings and what the Lord has done in our lives, but let's not take for granted what he's done. Do we realize what we've had? And, and Moses is telling this to the people of Israel. Let me say, it's not, a, it's not a bad thing to desire blessings. It's not a bad thing to want to be a, a great nation. It, it's not a bad thing to want good things for the people around you. As a pastor, and I pray for the individuals in our church, and I, I look at, there, there are things that I want for you. There are things that I, I pray for that I desire. And I hope that we can not just look at our family, not just look at our church, not even just look at our city and our community, but look at our nation and say, man, there are some wonderful blessings that I would love to see come from God for our nation, for the leaders of our nation, for the laws of our nation, for the people of our nation, and, and hope for greatness. The problem is that many people have the wrong idea of greatness. It, our, our worldly philosophies have shaped what we look at. There are people that, that look at this election and they say, well, America's already, already headed into greatness. Look at the stock market. Look at what's already happened in the last week. Look at crypto. It's doubled. I mean, Bitcoin hit new high. Look at all this. Hey, and they have this idea of greatness that does not match what the scriptures say. There are many people that look at wealth and material success as an indicator of greatness. But Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasures here on earth. Power and control over others. But Jesus said, whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Servant. There are many people that judge the greatness of a nation by popularity or approval from others. But the Bible tells us that, that we ought to obey God rather than men. There are many that judge it based on our self-sufficiency and independence. But Jesus said, abide in me, for without me, ye can do 
nothing. Many people look at physical strength or beauty, our military, or the land. But we understand that God uses the, the weak things of the world to confound the mighty. Many people look at the, the high status or, or titles. They look at comparing themselves. And we understand the scripture says that that is unwise. They look at influence or, or fame. But we see the scriptures call us to quiet diligence. It says, study to be quiet and to do your own business. We see many people look at greatness and look for perfection or flawlessness. But Jesus said, my strength is made perfect and weakness. People look for personal happiness or comfort. But Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. People look at high achievement and ministry, or these, but God values faithfulness. And we, we put our priorities and our emphasis in all the wrong areas when we judge greatness. Hey, let's make sure we have the right measuring stick. You ever taken out and, and looked at the wrong side of the tape measure where you thought, it was, you thought it was inches, but instead it was somehow like meters or centimeters or something like that? Am I the only one that's ever done that? You, know, you got to be careful. I'm the only one. Thank you, Miss Nancy. I appreciate that testimony there. No, but be careful what you're measuring with. Hey, you're going to end up with something you didn't want if you're measuring with the wrong stick or the wrong tape measure. I want to look here in this passage and say, what is a nation that is great in the eyes of God. We see a description that's laid out here in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Moses is telling them, there is no nation that is so great as this one, and he tells them why. He tells them how their nation has become great, what they need to be thankful for in this passage. And I want to look at four areas of greatness that can elevate a nation. Four areas of greatness. Number one, personal responsibility. Personal responsibility. Look with me in verse 9 there. Deuteronomy chapter 4, in verse 9, he jumps right into this. He, said, he asks these questions. He says, after those questions, only take heed to everyone else around you. No. He says, take heed to thyself. Thyself. And to keep thy soul diligently. He goes on, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, and he goes on and talks about the next generations. But he starts out, he says, only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. A nation that is great in the eyes of God is full of men and women that take heed to themselves. That take heed to themselves when it comes to, to spiritual matters, when it comes to their, their souls. Get your eyes off of the people around you. You look at, at, man, it's so easy to pick on this election, so much wrong with everything, but you look at one side, they don't even look at themselves. They're not for anything, it seems like, but they look at the other side. Look at all the problems that they have over there. You should elect us. We should be your leaders. Yeah, they don't actually have any ideas. They're not actually standing on biblical principles. They're not actually saying the good things that they want to do, but they're pointing at the other people. And hey, we have a, a society that has made it, made their, their platform everything that they're all about, looking at other people. I'm better than him. I'm better than them. Well, I, I, can, I can... And the Bible says here, only take heed to thyself. Take your eyes off of people around you and ask yourself, how is your relationship with God? I'm not asking about your pastor. I'm not asking about your parents. I'm not asking about anyone else, but I'm asking about you. How is your soul? How is your Walk with the Lord. There is safety and, and blessing, I'll tell you, that's found under uh, living under the authority of the righteous. And I, I praise the Lord for the fact that I was born in a home with godly parents. I thank the Lord for the blessing that came upon me because of my parents that lived for the Lord. And young people that are here today, hey, you be thankful that you have authorities over you that put you in, in a place of safety and a place of blessing, but that won't last forever. There are times, you are one day, let's just say even, let's just say that even today that the Lord came, one day you are going to stand before God and give an answer for yourself. The Bible says it is un appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And in that judgment, you're going to stand before God on your own. You're not going to be able to point over, but, but Brother Terry told me, but, but my mom and dad said, but they were going to, no, we stand before God on our own. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 5, it says, 
for every man shall bear his own burden. And the only way that you'll avoid the flames of hell is if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. You can't rely on someone else's faith. You can't rely on the things that other people have taught you. Hey, it has to be a decision that comes from you. Faith that comes from your heart. Your pastor's spirituality won't help you. Your priest, he won't help you. Your, your parents, none of those things. Every man shall bear his own burden. But we live in a society that wants to offload responsibility. They want to point their finger at, at someone else. It's, it's their fault. I can't do this or that or the other because, well, my upbringing, it, it traumatized me. You don't understand what my parents put me through. Hey, I, there are parents that raise their kids wrong. I praise the Lord for the blessing that I had in parents. And I don't, I don't want to demean what I have and what other people, but at the same time, there's, a, there's an element of personal responsibility that we need to stand up to. Hey, you cannot blame things on your parents forever. You cannot blame things on other people forever. People say, I can't because I don't have enough time. I can't because it's just who I am. I can't because the system is against me. I can't because everyone's influencing me the wrong way. I can't because it's too stressful and people have excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse and they never look at themselves. Hey, believers, if we're going to have a nation that is great in the eyes of God, we have to take heed to ourselves. This blame, it doesn't just happen in the world. It happens in the church house too. It, it most certainly does. Let me tell you though where you cannot point fingers when it comes to your relationship with God. Hey, if you're not walking with God, it's no one's fault but yourself. No one. Take heed to thyself. Psalm 145, verse 18 and 19. It says, The Lord is nigh unto all them that have great parents and a wonderful upbringing. And people, no, no. Nigh unto all them that call upon him. All them that call upon him. Hey, there's no excuse. Every one of us can have the Lord close at hand if we turn to him, if we walk with him. But Satan does everything he can to keep us from taking time to pray, taking time to walk with God, taking time to pay attention to our souls. God's ready. He wants to be close. James 4, 8 says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double mind. He says he's ready there. He wants to draw nigh. We can't blame people around us. We can't blame our parents or our pastor, a boss or our upbringing or difficult circumstances or our negative experiences with church and religion or unanswered prayers that we perceive to be that way or addictions or health disorders. We can't blame the world and its attractions. We can't blame busy schedules and lack of time. We can't blame behavior of others. Our walk with God is dependent upon one person. And he tells them here, he says in this passage, he says, only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. Reminds me of the song. It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord. We need some people that will take responsibility. We're not going to have a great nation unless we first have individuals that take responsibility when it comes to spiritual well-being. So we see number one, if we're going to elevate a nation to greatness in God's eyes, there needs to be personal responsibility. Look now in verses 9 and 10 with me. The end of verse 9, we read that there, it says, And lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Especially in that day, the day, that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. You see something mentioned at the end of both of those verses there. It says, But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. The end of verse 10, it says, And that they may teach their children. <coughs> a nation that is great in the eyes of God is teaching 
and training the next generation. A nation that's great in the eyes of God is teaching and training the next generation. They're, they're passing the torch on to the next generation. And I'll tell you, the system of this world has convinced parents, it has convinced people that you can just offload this teaching and training. You can let someone else go ahead and do that. I mean, what, what a sad thing it is. People, I, I think that most people understand this nowadays, but especially, I want to say 20, 30 years ago, people used to think they could just sit their, their kid in front of the TV, put on the educational programs, of course, the educational programs, and let them let those kids just go ahead and soak in the goodness. They were going to go ahead and be edu. No, that's not the way it works. You know, it, it doesn't. We know what what the result of that is. They're going to learn more than they bargained for. They sit in front of that in front of that TV. Hey, be careful. And you think people try to convince you? The schools, they've got it handled. They'll educate your kids. They'll let them know the things that they need for life. And, and you, you come out of school and there's so much that you don't know. And there's so many things that you're taught there that, that you shouldn't have been taught that, that, are, that are trouble. Hey, be careful. And I, I say all this to say that parents, it is your responsibility to train children. It's your responsibility. Hey, use the tools that God gives you. Use books, use schools, use educational programs, use apps, use all these other things, use the things that are good, but you are ultimately responsible for passing on the truth of the word of God to the next generation. Proverbs 22 and verse six, it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Hey, it is possible for parents to train children in the way that God has laid out for them to train and them to continue and do what's right. Now, our world today, they says, hey, they say, it's impossible. Parents, you're not going to be able to do it on your own. You need all this help. You need all these other things. You, hey, parents, you can train your children. God gave you this responsibility. There are young people, though, unfortunately, that have been raised in church-going families that can't quote 20 scriptures. They don't have a basic understanding of the truths of God's word. They couldn't quote or recite the scripture or the books of the Bible. They couldn't tell you the, the names of the 12 disciples. We're not going to have a test here today, don't worry. But there, there's, there, are, there are young people that it is clear truth has not been passed on. When confronted with temptation, they have no answer. They have no idea how to defend their faith. They're ethically and morally confused about some of these basic issues of abortion or gender, and they have no idea what, what standards they have or why they have these standards. No answer for why they live and believe the way that they do. They can't spend five minutes in prayer before they run out of things to say to God. They can't spend 10 minutes in the Word of God without getting distracted. No commitment to holiness, no separation, more attached to popular music than the doctrinal hymns of the faith, no evangelistic responsibility, a poor understanding of service and, and sacrifice. They rely on cultural Christianity. Look around at the believers around them and see the things that they believe and the things that they're doing and what they allow. They have no understanding of the truth of the Word of God. And you look at that, and yes, there, there's personal responsibility involved. There are things, every person has the opportunity to study and, and learn on their own and pull these things out. There are people that, that do that. But at the same time, it's an evidence of the failure of training the next generation. Hey, we, if we're going to have a, a nation that is great in the eyes of God, we have to teach and train the next generation. And these things, they don't happen on their own. They don't happen by accident. Satan makes sure of that. He puts obstacles in the way. He puts distractions. He puts things that are going to make it difficult. But the next generation has to be trained. They need to have the serious conversations. They need to be held accountable. They need to be given the resources. They need to be taught and, and mentored. They need to have these serious conversations. Well, what if someone asks this? What do we do then when this occurs? They need to be given direction and study. They need to be given tasks and held accountable. Have you read your Bible today? What did you learn and get out of your Bible? What does that mean to you? Let's practice your memory verse together. Hey, that's not just for five and six-year-olds either. Hey, that's for teenagers as well. Encourage and build up and, and mentor. You know, hey, did you get a chance to share the gospel out this morning? How did it go? What, what did it look like? Why, why didn't you volunteer to serve when that, that need was, was made known? Why do we 
choose to have these standards and listen to this music or not to that or read or watch these things and not those things. Hey, the next generation needs to be trained. I'll say it again, a nation that is great in the eyes of God is teaching and training the next generation. It starts with parents. It does. I'll say nobody cares about your kids, parents, more than you do. Nobody. Your, your teachers, they may, love, you may have the, they may have the greatest teachers in the world. They're still not going to love kids as much as the parents do. And that's why God gave this responsibility to the parents. But it's not just about parents and their own children. In a broader sense, this is about perpetuating truth to the next generation. Moses knew something about training the next generation. We know about Moses and his follower, Joshua, right? Moses and Joshua. Moses prepared Joshua to lead the Israelites into the promised land, and, and he did a good job by all accounts. He mentored Joshua. He trained him. He laid hands on him. He brought him up uh, as the next generation of leadership. And this was not just a, a good idea that Moses happened to have. You know what I'm going to do one day? I'm going to go ahead and I've got, no, this was something that God told him to do. Numbers 27, we see the Lord said unto Moses, take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit and lay thine hand upon him. And he goes on and gives him instructions of charging him and preparing him for this leadership. And this is the pattern we see repeated throughout the scripture. You know, we see Eli and Samuel, you know, for all the wickedness that we know of Eli and the problem with his own sons. We know that he trained Samuel to listen to the voice of God. There was some mentorship. There was some training. There were some things that he passed on to the next generation. I think of David and, and Solomon. David prepared Solomon to be king. He gave him the, the plans for the temple. He taught him how to serve uh, God faithfully. I like this passage in 1 Chronicles 28. He says, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart. And with a willing, willing mind, for the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. There are more passages that illustrate the, the teaching that went there between David and Solomon. But hey, there was an example of this mentorship, this training. You come to the New Testament, you think of Paul and Timothy. I mean, how, how can you miss that mentorship, that training that we see going on there? Paul mentored him and encouraged him to take on leadership roles and taught him how to be a faithful servant of Christ. We see in Timothy says, and the things which thou hast heard of me. There was some training. There was some teaching. There were some truths that were being passed to the next generation here between Paul and Timothy. I think of Jesus and his disciples. He invested three years spending time with these disciples all over. They walked and they, they worked and he taught them and he explained the things that they didn't understand and he corrected the things that the mistakes that they made and he, he mentored them and sent them out. Titus chapter 2 and verse 3 through 5, it talks about the older women teaching the younger women. I know none of the ladies like to claim to be older women, but hey, if you're older than someone else, then you are a, an older woman. There you go. Just, that's the way it is. It says the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, teaching these younger women that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. And it goes on here. We see this mentorship. We see this passing truth from one generation to the next. It's, it is important. It's critical. We cannot lose truth. We have to have, when it comes to our churches, we have to have multi-generational faith. We need to pass our faith and the truths of the word of God to the next generation, but not just for our church, for the sake of our nation. If our nation is going to be a great nation, if it's going to be uh, the type of nation that the Lord sees as great, we have to pass on truth to the next generation. Or here, behind every successful minister are individuals that took seriously this obligation to train the next generation. And you can read the stories of D.L. Moody. What a preacher. He took two continents and, and shook them for the Lord, a, a powerful man of God, but he had a Sunday school teacher that loved him and chased him down and made sure he got in church. And he was someone who mentored him and taught him truth. 
And it's a sad state of affairs when we have churches and pastors that are neglecting the next generation. I mean, it's a sad thing to see so many churches, and I see it. I have pastor friends that, that I, I have on social media as friends, and I see churches that are having pastors that are leaving. Nobody to step up. Nobody trained. Nobody ready to step into those positions. You think that that's God's will? Do you think that that's God's plan for the church to just fall apart with no leadership, no pastor? No, that's not God's plan. It's that we are failing to pass on the truth of God's word to the next generation. And I'll tell you, it's not easy. It, it, it's, it's often difficult. to. It, it's, it's easier for a pastor to sit there and do everything on his own. I'll just go ahead and do it on my own. I'll just go ahead and take care of that. And then to stop and train and spend time and give opportunities to other people and then do the correction that goes, hey, that's never fun. I know some people think the pastor likes to just get up there and harp on anyone and everyone. And hey, we're, we're people too. We don't like that confrontation, but it's a part of passing on truth to the next generation. It requires more work than just doing it on your own. It requires humility. It requires openness and people seeing and your failings and shortcomings. And it won't always succeed. There are going to be people that you're going to spend time with you're going to train, you're going to prepare, and they're going to go off and do something else. They're going to lead the ministry. They're going to, but at the same time, this is the command of God, that we pass the truth to the next generation. What are we doing to train the next generation? Quite clearly, first of all, are we cleaning, training our own children? Are we training those that God has given us that direct responsibility uh, for? Are we putting the time and the effort, doing it in an orderly fashion? Well, we'll just have a conversation whenever it comes up about these. No, that doesn't happen. Satan's going to make sure that these tough issues don't get, they don't come up, that they don't get addressed. Hey, that's not how you'd handle it. If you're going to teach and train, do it in an orderly fashion. Make sure you cover the things that need to. Read the Bible, discuss it, apply it. Like in Sunday school, sing together, pray together, serve together. Are you training? your own children, but also others. Hey, take someone soul winning with you. I, I was so glad to hear the other day of uh, Gideon going out. It just encourages me to, to see you know, people reaching out and pulling other people along. Take someone with you and clean the church. Take someone with you and do a project that needs to be done. Take someone with you and, and just teach them. The older women, train those younger women. And the question here is, where is your Joshua? Where is your Timothy? Where is the person that you're trying to pass on to the next generation? What can be done to elevate a nation to greatness in God's eyes? Number one, take personal responsibility. Number two, teach the next generation. Number three here, we're halfway through the message. And it's 11.57, here we go. We got it, we got it done here. I appreciate that smile of encouragement, Brother Eka. There you go. It says here in verse 10, it says, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God and Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. <coughs> A nation that is great in the eyes of God prioritizes the assembly of God's people. A nation that is great in the eyes of God prioritizes the assembly of God's people. Oh, here we go again. We're talking about attendance at church. Yes, here we go again, because the scriptures clearly say that it's important, and it's something that's brought up here. Here we see a gathering of God's people. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 10 is referring specifically back to the gathering of the Israelites back at Mount Sinai. It's also called Mount Horeb here. And this is where God gave them the Ten Commandments. That's where God established his covenant with them. That's where they witnessed God's power. That's where they heard God's voice. And let me say quite simply that God does great things when his people are gathered together. God does great things. I look back at the important decisions that I've made in my own heart, my own life, the calling to the ministry, the decisions to, to live for the Lord, to abstain from sex before marriage and stay, stay pure for my wife. And these important decisions that I made as a young person and even as an adult, all of them happened in church, in the assembly of God's people. Hey, it's a wonderful place, an atmosphere where we hear the, the word of God proclaimed and, and proclaimed in a strong way. And, and God does great things when his people are gathered together. Deuteronomy 29 has the story of Israel about to enter the promised land. And what did God do? 
Surprise, surprise. He gathered God's people together. And when he gathered God's people together there, he renewed that covenant. He reminded them of God's laws, the blessings and the, the curses. And this was a pivotal moment calling them to commitment and obedience before they went into the promised land. In 2 Kings 23, we see King Josiah found the book of the law in the temple. And what a shame, it was lost. And what did he do? You guessed it. He called the people together. And what did he do when, when he called the people together? He read the word of God. And this gathering led to a, nation, a nationwide repentance, a renewed covenant, a removal of idolatry throughout the land. And I'll say it again. God does great things when his people are gathered together. Nehemiah chapter 8. We see the people had returned from Babylon, Babylonian captivity with, with Ezra. What did he do? You guessed it. He gathered God's people together. And they read and they taught the law of Moses. And these gatherings led to revival. And it led to repentance. And it renew, led to renewed commitment to following God's law. Because God does great things when his people are gathered together. Go to the New Testament. You look at Acts chapter 2. And you see at the, the day of Pentecost. Man, what a day that was. People were gathered from around the world and needed to hear the gospel. What did God do? He gathered his people together. And these apostles and the believers in the early church, they were gathered in one place when the Holy Spirit descended on them and sent them out preaching the gospel in an amazing and miraculous way. Praise the Lord. We know that Peter followed that up with preaching to the assembled crowd, resulting in 3,000 people being saved and baptized and added to the church because God does great things when his people are gathered together. You get the idea? You see this here? I'm going to keep on going anyways. Too bad. I wrote down here Acts chapter 19 in Ephesus, that idolatrous city. We see God did a great work, but what did he do first? He gathered his people together. And Paul, the Bible says, daily taught in the school of Tyrannus, gathering people to hear the word of God. And what was the result? It says, all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. And that's amazing. The Bible is not just hyperbolic here. It's not just making things up and saying things like everyone and anyone. It says all. It means all as a result of God's people being gathered together and studying and learning the word of God. God does great things when his people are gathered together. And a nation that is great in the eyes of God prioritizes the gathering of God's people. The obvious application is, is the gathering of God's people a priority in your life? Is it something that's important to you? Not just because your uncle makes you, not just because your parents, not just because you're expected to be there, not just because you have responsibilities as a greeter or handing out the, you know, not, not because of other people, but because you see it as important in your own life. Is the gathering of God's people a priority? Or would you rather take a nap? Would you rather stay home and mow the lawn? Would you rather sit in front of the television and play a board game or relax at home after a long day? But when God's people are gathered, I'll tell you, personally, I want to be there. It hurts me when I'm sick and I'm not able to be at home, not able to be at church. It hurts me when, when I, I, I was just thinking the other day when I, when I was sick and not able to be here in church and the things I missed out on, even the missions conference over at community, I was hoping to be there. I wanted to, to be a part of that. I wanted to be in the place where God's people are gathered because he blesses that gathering. I know that I'm missing out on encouragement. I miss out on fellowship. I miss out on the opportunity to serve. I miss out on the accountability. The believers around me asking me questions and helping me to be where I need to be. I miss out on the music. I miss out on the opportunity to give. I miss out on the guidance and the direction. I miss out on the proclamation of the word of God. I miss out on the teaching. I miss out on the training. And God, or Moses told God's people, part of what made this nation great was this gathering of God's people when they made it a priority to hear the word of God. We need some people that will make it a priority to be in God's house whenever his people are gathered. Hey, Sunday school, I'll be there. Sunday morning, I'll be there. Sunday night, I'll be there. Wednesday night, I'm going to be there because I don't want to miss out on what God has for me. I want God to work in my life at every opportunity. A nation that's great in the eyes of God prioritizes the assembly of God's people. What can be done to elevate a nation? Number one, take personal responsibility. Number two, teach the next generation. Number three, prioritize the assembly of God's people. The last thing I see here, and I'll be quick, is verses 10 
through 13. Look in verse 10 here. It says, Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord, thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children, that they may learn to fear me. We won't read all the remaining verses there, but I want to say that a nation that's great in the eyes of, of God fears and obeys God. Hey, and this word fear is not a misnomer. It's not missaid. There ought to be a true fear of God, an understanding of the power and the judgment of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13 tells us the, the importance here. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Amen. Do you fear God? Do you understand the power of God, the judgment, the destruction, the, the, the real power of God? We have a nation that lives in sin. They revel in it with no fear of the consequences. They'll do whatever they feel like, do whatever, whatever they want to do, please themselves with no consideration of what the scripture says about the end of that sin. No consideration of the death, no considering of, uh, consideration of the destruction, no consideration of the pain, no consideration of the, of the suffering. And because of that, there is unbelievable destruction and suffering and pain. Look at the broken families around us today. Just, just look around. The hurting people. Look at the, I, I don't have time to go into it, but many people continue in these things, just no fear of God. They continue with the love of money and things, which God says, drown men in destruction and perdition. They continue in sexual immorality and lust. And the Bible says that Whoso, you know, he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. It talks about the destruction of the flesh. It's a, a terrible thing. It, not to mention the, the destruction on people outside as well, those that it affects. The Bible talks about pride and arrogance. It goes before destruction, before a fall. The Bible talks about drunkenness and drinking and substance abuse, about dishonesty and deception about rebellion and God's design for rebellion from God's design for marriage and the family. It talks about revenge and violence and anger. And there are people that care nothing for what the scriptures say about these things. Why? Because they have no fear of God, no consideration of the end of this sin. A nation that is great in the eyes of God fears and obeys God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. We cannot, and I don't have time to go into all of this, but you know, many times the problem when it comes to this is that we try to peacefully coexist with sin. It doesn't happen. We read this morning in James chapter 4, you know, friendship with the world is enmity with Christ. Hey, you're, you're, the, you're the friend of Christ or you're the enemy. You cannot live in the middle of these two. Uh, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil goes on, pride and arrogancy in the evil way and the froward mouth, do I put up with a case? No, he says, do I hate? Do I hate? Tolerance is not a fruit of the Spirit. Right. Tolerance is not a fruit of the Spirit. You look at what long-suffering is, it's very different from tolerance. Long-suffering is, is dealing with this persecution, this trouble of sin, uh, but, but tolerance is allowing it giving it permission to continue, just putting up with it. Hey, tolerance is not a fruit of the, spirits, uh, of, the, of the Spirit, and we should not be fine with sin. Those that make sin their public identity should not be the believer's friends. Listen carefully. Hey, we, we ought to be friends with the world. We ought to express our friendship, share the truth of the Word of God, build people up, influence them in the right way, but don't let that influence come the other direction. Don't let that come toward us. You know, there is a, a fundamental dissonance between a person who lives for the Lord and a person who lives in sin openly and publicly and makes that a part of their identity. You say, I have gay friends. Well, I hope you have acquaintances that maybe you're trying to win to the Lord. I hope that you have acquaintances that you're trying to minister to and help them. But you cannot continue together in harmony with people that are living in sin and claim to fear God. 
You cannot claim to be living and walking, for, walking with the Lord. The Bible says clearly, can two walk together except they be agreed? And the answer is no, they cannot. Do you fear God? Do you live in reverence, in consideration of his power, in consideration of his judgment of sin? Psalm 128 and verse 1 says, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. A nation that is great in the eyes of God fears and obeys God. Hey, today, it's a simple message. It's not a complicated thing. Look at it here. What can be done to elevate a nation to greatness in God's eyes? Number one, take personal responsibility. Number two, teach the next generation. Number three, prioritize the assembly of God, God's people. Number four, fear God and obey his commandments. Dear Heavenly Father, we want our nation to be blessed. I believe that's the wish and prayer of every believer that's here in this church today. But Lord, we want your blessing. And we understand that to receive your blessing, we have to come to you in the way that you called us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us, as the scriptures say here, to first of all, examine our own hearts and our own lives, Lord. Help us to take full responsibility for our own soul, for our spiritual walk, not to make excuses. Lord, I pray you'd help us to pursue the training of that next generation. I pray you'd help us to make our attendance in church a, a priority, something that we see as important and needful. And Lord, I pray you would help us most importantly of all to walk in the fear of God and obey your commands. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the music plays this morning, it's a time of invitation. I hope you'll take a moment and pray. Talk to the Lord. Hope you'll examine your own heart and say, Lord, what are some areas here that I can act on? Some things that I can do, some actions that I can take so that I can see greatness here in my nation, a biblical greatness, a greatness that honors the Lord. Take a moment and talk to him.